Okay, now it's started recording. Uh, super excited to be here and thank you so much for joining. And I can guarantee that you'll be learning something new today. First of all, my name is uh, Imad. Uh, my mother language is uh, uh, Central Kurdish. It's also called Sorani. Uh, if you look at this map, the darker area is where my mother tongue is, is Central Kurdish. It's uh, mostly in the north of Iraq and part of Iran. And the upper part is called the Northern Kurdish or Kurmanji. And then we also have the Southern Kurdish. So my mother tongue is the central one. And uh, I learned Persian uh, when I was a child in Iran. So I spent almost uh, seven to eight years of my childhood in Iran, elementary school. I mean, I, was, I learned Persian and Kurdish at the same time. So we were moving uh, in Iran a few places. Some places were like around here where the population could speak Kurdish, but some, type, some places where it was just fully Persian. Uh, for Turkish, I studied uh, Turkish four years in high school uh, when we returned back to Iraqi Kurdistan region. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Turkish uh, schools. That's where I was introduced to Turkish language. And Arabic, uh, because of uh, the religion, uh, I'm a Muslim, and we have to read the religious texts, like the Quran in classical Arabic, and also my college, and also we have uh, mandatory classes. And also because of the proximity, uh, you are exposed to the Arabic language a lot more. Uh, that's how I learned these languages. Today, in this uh, short presentation, I will quickly go through the Turkish language, the Arabic script, the Persian language and the Arabic dialects. Uh, if you notice, there's no Kurdish because I already talked a little bit about Kurdish. And whenever I see uh, a chance, I'll talk about it. And also because it's a little bit uh, similar to Persian and the time is so short. Otherwise, I would just add one extra for Kurdish. So if you look at our area, if you remember the map before, like where the Kurdish was spoken, uh, we are kind of in between three different language families, which is quite, quite interesting. Uh, one is the afro oceanic things like the Semitic and the Arabic. One is the Indo-European. Indo the other one is the Turkic languages. So that area is like, stays like between three different language families. And the Arabic is one of these language families. It has around uh, 400 million uh, speakers. Uh, second one is Turkish. Turkish has around 100 million speakers. But if you include all the Turkic uh, languages, it's probably more than 200 million. So it's also a massive language. And Persian, around 110 million, including like uh, all the varieties, like uh, it's called Dari in Afghanistan and Tajik in Tajikistan. So it just like goes all that way to Tajikistan and even some other places. It's very important to remember that there are like three uh, different language families and Kurdish and Persian belong to the same language family. So. Kurdish and Persian, they belong to the same uh, branch. Like uh, they all belong to the Western part of the Indo-Iranian language. That means they are very similar in the grammar. There are a lot of common words. There are, it's a lot easier to learn, but uh, it's still a different language. So it's not mutually intelligible, but if you bring a Kurdish speaker, want to learn Persian, it will take uh, probably three to six months to be fluent instead of two or three years. It takes a lot, lot less. Okay, so that was just a very quick introduction. Now we will talk about our first language, Turkish. I like Turkish language because it's very uh, systematic and it's very consistent. Like when I'm learning Spanish, there are more irregularities than regularities. It's just like all these conjugations, all these, like everything is, you have to learn everything separately. But for Turkish, it's just so systematic. It's so consistent. Once you learn the grammar, or once you learn some of the, how the rules work, then you can just start learning the, the, the vocabulary and just put all the words that you learn into that uh, block. And it's just like, uh, you don't spend or waste so much time learning the irregular things in Turkish. And also, so very, uh, very phonetic. That means after you learn the alphabet, it's not like the English word. If the word says something, but you read it, it's completely different. Everything is the way it's written. So that's another big uh, time saving. So these two things should be enough to get you excited to learn Turkish. And the Turkish alphabet, another good thing is it's using the Latin based script. And most of the word, 
letters are almost exactly the same. So you're not learning any new sounds, except like maybe one or two, like I highlighted them in uh, blue. For example, this letter is like a, a it's like ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. So even, even if you don't say it, if you can just say ya, people will still be able to understand you. That's the beauty of it. And the second one, balik, like uh, balik, that means fish, kopek. Like it's like an o, not kopek, kopek. And then the last one is uh, you, when you say face, use, use. So, u uh, and u. Uh. I don't think that would be very difficult compared to when I will show you a little bit later Arabic. So, this is uh, this is as easy as we can get. I think uh, if you start learning Turkish, you will not have any problem with the pronunciation, nor the alphabet, nor the grammar. Most of the new sounds are actually in the vowels. So, only the vowels are a bit different. And one cool thing about the Turkish, which I really had uh, to like change how I think about languages, was that agglutinative. Uh, agglutinative means glue, glue in uh, Latin. So it's just like you're you just have a word and you just glue things and things together. So let me give you an example. A very good example is in English. I have this phrase: "If you didn't go, if you didn't go." That's like we use four or five words for this. But in Turkish, git means go. And then you just add one more part to make it negative, gitme. And then you just add one more part, the conditional, if. So gitmese, if not go. And then for the past, you just add another suffix, de. And to say that you didn't go, you just put one last word. So gitmeseydin, just one word. All these suffixes together, glue together, it means if you didn't go. And you can just look at the go, not, if, did you. You can just see how different it is, the, even the grammar from the English, the word order. And I wasn't sure if this was correct or not. So I typed this word in the Google. And uh, luckily for me, there was a song just called It <laughs> So <laughs> if you didn't go. And also one more thing that is, uh, you will find it a bit uh, unique in Turkish is called vowel harmony. So the vowel harmony says that a word have to be the members of the same vowel. You cannot just randomly pick the ending. For example, in Turkish, uh, if you want to make a word plural, first you have to see what is the last letter of this word that you want to add. You have two options, either L-A-R or L-E-R. So you have to look at the last uh, vowel of the word. For example, this word. What is the last uh, vowel of this word? A, right? Araba. Araba means car. So if I want to make this word plural, should I use L-A-R or L-E-R? Lar. Very good. Exactly. Yes. So L-A-R because uh, the vowel is A. So yeah, that's how you make a word plural. So that's the, the whole idea. You look at the last vowel and then most of the time you have two or four options. And then when you say Arabalar, it's just like the, the rhythm. It just continues. Like you, you're using the same vowel. So the, the, the speech is a bit more smoother. Next one is kedi, means a cat. We look at the vowel. The I is in this group. So if we want to make a plural, then we use the, the other one, L-E-R, right? So that's the whole vowel, vowel harmony rule. And then we have made a great uh, video, if I don't say it myself. Uh, you can learn all the basics of Turkish in eight minutes. Other video is 16 minutes. Uh, so to learn more about this, you can go to our Klosika channel and watch this video and people love it. And you will learn about all the details very quickly. And after, if you memorize everything in this video, because I said like Turkish is so consistent, then you can literally start learning the vocabulary and you can apply it right away to Turkish. And uh, one more thing that I will be doing is I will compare these languages with the Arabic and I will see how many loan words do they have. Because this also, I think, is very interesting. Turkish has a lot of loan words. I mean, compared to uh, Persian and Kurdish, it has a lot less loan words. It used to have a lot more during the Ottoman Empire and then that Ottoman Turkish. But since 1930s, they have cleaned the language. They have replaced a lot of the Arabic words and Persian words for pure Turkish words. So today, I think uh, learning Ar uh, Turkish would be a lot more difficult for an Arabic or Kurdish or Persian speaker 
but in the past it was a lot easier but still i went through the top maybe 30 words like uh, there was a, a word list of the particular frequency and i just glanced over the top 30 and i found a few words for example the word amma but it actually came from the arabic word amma and then the word shay it's like when you say thing these are very very common words okay it's actually easy to recognize came from the arabic word shay and a few other more not even that there are also a lot of uh, uh, words that came from the persian or classical persian for example when you say yes and no higher that means no actually came from the na khair no good that means if you're learning turkish you will also be learning a lot of arabic and persian words as well maybe not as many as the others but still uh, whatever language you're learning you'll be learning a bit of the other one as well next one we will be talking about the arabic script this is the map of where in which part of the world like uses this script either as an official script or like that comes with the other scripts i think just this map should make you start learning the arabic script right away just because of how widespread it is and how many people are actually using it it's just so important i don't know just look at this map it's like half of the world so <laughs> and of course we are in the middle of this uh, this place we kurdish and persian and arabic we all use the arabic script or arabic based scripts so this is the arabic alphabet okay so this is if you look at it it's really not that difficult like have you seen japanese have you seen chinese i mean this alphabet is not really that difficult and uh yes in arabic persian kurdish like uh we they're a little bit different but most of the letters are almost the same each language uses a little bit different sounds a few different sounds that are not existent but the majority of the writing system is almost uh, identical but you also have to remember that although they are sharing the same alphabet these are still different languages that means if you bring a person who speaks kurdish and a one who speaks persian and arabic and if they speak for one hour none of them will understand each other if they have never studied each other's languages just to remember that these are still different languages okay to actually learn how to recognize arabic kurdish and persian text like in five minutes like you look at one text and you know what language it is you can watch uh, one of our videos that we did on the uh, on glossika so it's uh, really literally in five minutes you'll be able to just say like which language is which and from that very basic alphabet you can create really beautiful calligraphy and arabic letters are really flexible they have these long tails that you can create beautiful uh, art and uh, a lot of religious texts are also using that uh, beautiful style so even just for the calligraphy you can still learn the, the alphabet uh, now we will talk about the standard arabic prepare to be amazed the standard arabic has uh, 28 letters and these are the sounds i will divide them between the sounds that you already know so you don't have to worry about and the sounds that you probably don't know or you have to learn these are the sounds you're already familiar with like b t th and j and stuff so and also i i also included the letter r like the rolled r like rrr, assuming that you already know that if not maybe you have to move that one as well but there are around 10 sounds that you are not familiar with so if you want to learn standard arabic you have to learn number one is actually the word alcohol it came from the Arabic word al kuhl It's like a it's like a h, but a, a lot deeper, like <laughs> like when you cough. <coughs> I'll pronounce it. <laughs> so when you say the the name Ahmad, it's actually not Ahmad. The real name is Ahmad. So, but but the closest sound to it is actually H. So even if you pronounce this letter as H, the native speakers will be able to understand you. The next one is the word that makes my throat pain, like it gives me a lot of pain, is the letter kh. kh. So we have a word, burj, people read it as khalifa, but every time you see kh, it's actually kh, it's not k. So the Arabic uh, reading would be burj khalifa, kh. You see, there's a, it's like a k, but there's a vibration when it comes out. And whenever I don't speak with my family for like 
two or three weeks and I called them again because Kurdish has so much I just like I will have a sore throat after that yeah it's it's, it's one of the very uh, fundamental sounds in Arabic and Kurdish and Persian and then all the others when you see s at the dot below it's just like an s how we said the h and h they're just a little bit deeper for example this one instead of letter s it's it's just like s but a little bit deeper this one is like letter d but a little bit deeper and like a t but a little bit deeper so each one of these letters even if you pronounce it just like the the letter like D or S and T, people still will understand you. But of course, you're, they will be amazed if you can actually, if you keep practicing and be able to pronounce them, uh, they will love it. And this one, my name, do you remember when I said my name is Imad? Actually, my, the, that letter starts with uh, So my real name is Imad. It's like, uh, like it's quite, quite low in here, Imad. Another word that you actually heard, Ali. Actually, it's not Ali, Ali, Ali. But the closest sound to it is more like an A, so Ali. Next one is a R. It's the same. If you can say bonjour, then you can actually say the sound. Bonjour, like that R. And last one is the letter Q, which is the country's name. It's not Qatar. The original sound is Qatar. Uh, the closest sound to this is the English word cut. So try to say cut, 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 and you will be very close uh, to pronouncing this word correctly. After you learn this alphabet, these sounds, uh, the challenge is not over yet. But before that, uh, what is this? It's a boat, right? Well, if you can see this is a boat then you already know one you already learned one letter of the arabic alphabet just remember this if you've never studied arabic so this is the first letter you can actually learn you just put one dot below it just remember the boat and this is letter b congratulations so just a boat with a dot below that's letter b that will help you remember now after you learn the sounds and you learn the alphabet and now you you're ready to learn the arabic but wait there's still one more thing. This is the letter B that we studied. Normally, there are some things above and below. If you have seen Arabic, you see a lot of like lines above and below. These are called diacritics. For example, if you have one line above, it's, uh, it becomes B. It's like an A, A vowel. If you have it below, it's actually B. So that letter B, you put that line, becomes B, and then B. And then when you put this one, it becomes B. The problem is, if you look at this word, the QTR, this is like if we, if we uh, romanize it, it's QTR. Most of the time, it's written like this without any diacritics. But either you have to study it or they have to put it. Otherwise, this word can mean a few things because you cannot see the di diacritics. But it could be, if, if the word has two diacritics above, it could be Qatar the country Qatar. If it has one of the U above it, it becomes Qutr. That means a diameter. If it has two on the first and second letter, it becomes Qutr. That means a rows or trains, like a lot of trains. If, it, if every letter has one, it would become like to filter and also to drip. And if it's like below to brass. Beginner content will all have those di diacritics but over time, you have to remember these and you have to memorize them. So this is another challenge for learning Arabic. And not only that, uh, but uh, the location of these diacritics also change based on their position in a sentence. For example, let's say you have a word that ends with that U. So this is like bu. I didn't, I didn't read, uh, write the rest of the words, not important. Let's say the last letter and it has one vowel U. But when you add, for example, a preposition or something like in that that vowel changes to e so instead of this one it becomes this one now imagine if you have a full sentence almost every vowel might change and then you have to remember that when you're talking live that's why the dialects do not have these changes the dialects are a lot simpler 
the dialects do not have these vowel changes and a lot easier. And also the last part of the Arabic uh, that's uh, like grammar related is when you have a noun and an adjective, when you're using a noun that is masculine, oh, uh, every word in Arabic is either masculine or feminine. So when you use a masculine noun, the adjective will also have to be changed into masculine. A feminine noun, the adjective will also be feminine. When it's plural, when it's dual, when it's definite, indefinite, and so on. So it's called like the whole sentence has to agree with each other. The Arabic also is very different from the Turkish. If you remember in Turkish, we said you have uh, suffixes and stuff. So you're gluing things to each other. Well, this is, a, this is a cool thing about having a different language family. In Arabic, everything comes down to three letter roots. Like for example, KTV. Like we have, you can have so many words like they all sprout from this three letter root. And then you have mold. Like from this three letter, you can, you can make so many words. So you have different mold. For example, the word to write, you can still see the, the K and T and B, but this mold just makes the things to become like a, a, a verb. To give you another example, I have brought a, a few uh, roots. For example, KTB is anything related to writing. If you remember this thing, you already know like 30 to 40 words. You learn another root, DRS. You, you learn another 20, 30 words. A lot of things related to studying, anything related to school, all come from this, this root. Anything related to opening, like even the keys or anything, all come from this, this root. So you learn a few roots and you can generate hundreds and hundreds of words. And then you have a, a, a few molds that you just apply these roots to it. For example, this kind of mold, like each letter of these roots, they will go into these uh, empty slots. It will become like English is uh, uh, when you say to run or to, it makes like a verb. For example, if I apply this KTB to this mold, what will it become? It will become kataba. Who can uh, do the second one for me? If I, if I put DRS into this mold, what will it become? Darasa, very good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, what about the, yeah, that, that was very good. Darasa, now you know, uh, uh, now you know an Arabic uh, a verb and a word and a root. And next one, FTH. Thank you for the replies. Fataha, very good, excellent. Thank you for replying. Yeah, so you see, the, the idea of the mold is very unique to Semitic languages. So yeah, that was Arabic. Uh, I hope I didn't scare you, but uh, we will get back to it a little bit later when we talk about the dialects. Persian, the beautiful language of Persian. I learned Persian when I was young. So I was speaking Kurdish at home and I was speaking Persian outside. So I learned it uh, like simultaneously with my language. It's also called Farsi. This is what actually Iranians call it. They're like, this is how they call their own language. They call it Farsi. But the English word is like Persian. This is what the English name of the language is. And uh, it has around 110 million. So if you're learning Persian, you will also be learning a bit of Urdu and all the other languages that are all uh, being influenced by, by Persian. So, but here, a big portion of Iran, a lot of uh, Afghanistan and also the Tajikistan all speak uh, Persian language. Yeah, it's, uh, in Afghanistan is known as Dari, and in Tajikistan is known as Tajik. Uh, the alphabet is quite similar to Arabic, but uh, it has a few extra sounds, but it's easier. For example, other than these extra sounds, like Arabic doesn't have the letter G or P or CH. Uh, yeah, so Arabic doesn't have these uh, sounds, but do you remember the word that I told you? I say it's like an S, but it's like S. In Persian, it's just a normal S, just a S. So if you can't pronounce S and you think the Arabic is difficult, so there's always Persian. And all these, they're all pronounced as a normal Z. And the uh, that I said, like my name is in Arabic is Imad, but in Persian it's Imad, it's just very soft, Imad. And there's another word 
ma'na. Ma'na in Arabic, ma'na. So it's very different. In Persian, the same word. Ma'na, ma'na. So a lot of the very difficult and deep uh, sounds have been kind of become very, very soft in Persian. It's just a normal H, Ahmad. So Persian is a lot, lot softer than the, than the Arabic. But you only have like these three letters, like the H, H, and H. The only, these are the only three sounds that you need to learn for Persian. Uh, Arabic numbers and Persian numbers are kind of similar, but they're a little bit different as well. I remember when, uh, when we came back, I was in Iran elementary school. And then the first day of the class, we had the simple, like a simple uh, math, math uh, examination. It was just like very basic, like some, like 50 plus something like that. And I knew everything it was like, everything was so easy, but I wrote them in the Persian and they look so similar, but I got zero. Like the professor gave me like zero, like not even like he was saying, what, what are you doing? Like he was even like a the professor didn't know what I was doing. And I thought if somebody could understand this, like if somebody, it's, it's not my fault, this is correct, but it's just like a different script. I tore it down and I never told my parents, but uh, I wish I kept it just to see that even when the languages are so similar, even when the things are so similar, but they're still different. And if somebody hasn't studied them, it will look uh, unrecognizable. And uh, one day Michael told me, Iman, do you know Tajik? I said, I don't know Tajik. He said, no, you know, I can teach you in two minutes. And then he started reading uh, something like this. And I can't read this. This is Cyrillic. Because Tajik is actually written in Cyrillic. I cannot read Cyrillic, but I understand because this is Persian. So he read it and I could understand it, but you couldn't understand it. If somebody could read it, I will understand it 100%. So that's the importance of having the, the same text. Like some of the most popular literature of the Middle Ages are written in Persian. So if you like poems and stuff, Persian is a must learn language. And one day I was looking at uh, Voyager's golden records, like uh, the NASA spacecraft golden uh, record. If you don't know, about this, it was just like uh, there were two identical phonograph records that were included on the Voyager spacecraft. And what, what I was interested in was uh, a, a portion of those, like there was like images of the word world and all the other songs and music. But one part was uh, uh, a greetings from 55 different languages. So I went through the languages and I saw, I saw Arabic, I saw Turkish and I saw Persian. And the Persian one was a uh, hello to the residents of the far sky. And I have the audio, I can play it a bit later. But the guy says the greeting in the first three seconds, but the audio is 12 seconds long. The guy says another poem. It reads another poem, but NASA didn't put any of the translation. So I was very curious what the poem was. So I looked for it and I found it. I thought it would just, would have been cool to add the, the translation for the poem as well. So I can play it now. Hopefully it wouldn't be too loud. So the first three seconds is the is the translation of this thing. Durud bar sakinin mawara asman ha bani yadam az aw yek peykaran ke dar afarinesh de yek gouharan choz vi be dard avarad rozgar de garoz ha ra namanat qarar. Like that must be like some people might listen to this and say wow that is a very long hello. But actually the guy says the hello and he reads a poem and the poem is this the poet was born in 1209 it talks about uh, like how the humans are all like part of the same family and we are all in essence we are all the same and when when when, when just like your body when a part of your body becomes ill the entire body will feel it so it's just a beautiful beautiful poem uh, such a pity they didn't uh, add the translation persians really love uh, poems and poetry the same thing for arabic and classical arabic and all the other languages but i think there's really uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on their poets and poems in, in persian so if you like anything about literature and poems i think persian is a, is a beautiful language okay now i did a comparison a vocabulary comparison in uh, arabic persian and kurdish let's just see how similar some of these things are 
for the word book, some words are exactly the same, almost exactly the same, like kitab, 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 in all the three languages. You can find probably 30 to 40 percent of the vocabulary are almost shared. Another, another like a uh, group is the Arabic is different. For example, in the word hand, yet it is different, but for the Kurdish and the Persian are the same because they are the same language family. So dest and dest, exactly the same. And sometimes the Arabic is very different and from the Persian and Kurdish, but the Persian and Kurdish are a little bit similar. For example, the raftan is in Persian, roishtin. Raftan, roishtin. They both start with R and end with N. So if, if I write it in the original text, it would look a lot similar, more similar, but it's still a little bit different. So there are also a lot of words that are similar, but because it, they have they have like separated for so long, they've become a little bit different. And there, there, are, there, are, there are words that are similar and all the same, but in one language, you have multiple choices. So if the person wants to, it, could, it will use the native words to not let you understand what, you, what, what they want to say. So for example, in, in this word, kalima, kaleme, and kalima. In Kurdish, we have two words, wusha and kalima. So, and we use both of them simultaneously, depending. If we want the others not to understand, we can like, uh, not include any of the loan words as much as we can. So you have these in, in all these languages as well. Like Turkish, you have the same thing. And of course, there are a lot of words that are because, like for example, the word child in Arabic is tifil, in Persian is kudak, in Kurdish is manal, completely different because these are different languages. Yes, there are a lot of similar words. Some words are also like similar to Kurdish and Persian, but there are also words that are completely different. That means you have to still study uh, each language. And the final part is the quickly we will talk about the Arabic dialects. Assuming that somebody wants to learn Arabic, you have a lot of different dialects. And the general rule of the dialect is the further they are from each other, the harder it is to understand. So the closer they are to each other, the better understanding they have. For example, if, if, if a person from like this area uses their dialect with the person from Iraq, this area, it will be unintelligible if they both use their own dialect. So like a geographical location is very, very important. But the good thing is almost every person who is literate in Arabic understands and speaks the standard Arabic. So uh, if you only know standard Arabic, almost every single literate person who can read and write, you can communicate with them without any problem. And uh, another thing is this tiny Egypt like it, the, it looks very tiny, but it actually has the highest and the most widely spoken dialect of all the Arabic, just because of the population. Like they have more than 100 million speakers. And also because of the power of the Arabic, uh, of the Egyptian Arabic media and songs and a lot of singers, even if they are from like different areas, they might sing in the Egyptian uh, Arabic. So Egyptian Arabic is very, very uh, popular. And uh, basically, Arabic dialects are different from the standard in a few parts. One of them is pronunciation. For example, in Arabic, the standard Arabic, you have the word qalb, which means heart. Qalb. Qalb. In Egyptian, it's alb. Like the q is turned to like a. Uh, some, sometimes, not always, but often the letter q is pronounced as a. Uh. And in Iraqi, that q is actually g, so galop same letter can become like different sounds in different uh, areas. The grammar, the dialects are a lot less strict. They don't have the dual form. They don't have all these ending vowels changes. And generally, it's a lot more forgiving. So the dialects are a lot uh, simpler. The vocabulary based on my own observation. This is my own observation. 80% of the vocabulary between the dialect and the standard Arabic are almost the same. So 80%, majority of the words are the same. Maybe 70 to 80%, depends on the on the dialect. And 10% of them is still recognizable. So maybe a little bit different. It sounds a little bit different, but still recognizable. And probably around 10% of it is just like really unique. Then you have to study it. 
That means if you know standard Arabic, you will still be able to, with a little bit of learning, like a very short period of time, you'll still be able to understand the majority of the dialect. The dialects are used in a daily conversations and songs and movies and almost anything else, like the religious and the books and all the other things, you use the standard Arabic. But for daily conversation, you still use the, the, the dialect. For example, when I studied the Egyptian Arabic, these few words came to me like, they were just like repeating a lot and a lot, again and again. So you have a lot of unique words. So that's why for every dialect, you need to learn a few unique words to that. And then the other rest of the words that are shared will make a lot more sense. But again, your knowledge of the standard Arabic is extremely, extremely important. Let's take one word, uh, anharda, okay? If a person has never studied Arabic, you look at this, oh, wow, these are really different words. But actually, anharda means day and this. So it's still anhar, nahar in the beginning, still is another word for day in, in Arabic. And also, da is a, a abbreviation from hada. So if your standard Arabic is really good, you'll be able to still like uh, easily recognize a lot of these words that are even look uh, different. Another example, hil means uh, to open in Moroccan Arabic, but in standard Arabic is fataha. Like if you remember the FTH, the root, you said anything related to, to opening, it was like the, is this word, fataha. So hil and fataha, they mean, they, they sound completely different, but if you know in standard Arabic, you know that halla means to loosen or to unfold. So just, just like encourage you to first learn the standard Arabic, make sure that you have a really solid understanding of it. And then slowly, if you want to study another dialect, uh, slowly you can uh, add that to your uh, routine. And if you want to learn more, we have a blog article, like why Moroccan Arabic sounds so different. We also have another video like everything that I talked about in this uh, dialect part, we have a video on the Glossika channel. And if you see, and if you're learning any uh, dialect and you see a word, you can easily just type the word and write etymology. And the Wikipedia does a great job of like, like cleaning and like just dissecting the word where it came from. And it's always, I find it always very helpful when you know where the word came from. Uh, and it just helps you to, to remember that word a lot uh, faster. And so if I want to answer this question, should I learn the modern standard Arabic or dialect, which have been asked a million times, I would say both. You need both of them. One for daily conversation, one for reading books, listening to the documentaries, official talks. You, you definitely need both of them. But which one should I start with? You should always start with the standard Arabic. So you have a foundation, you have some rules, you have some like basic uh, things to follow. Learn the basic grammar and vocabulary, and then slowly start exposing yourself. Learn those, like especially if you really want to learn the Egyptian Arabic, you can slowly add those uh, words that are different, and or like uh, you you can uh, hear those words that are spelled differently. But uh, almost always, if you're a beginner, I recommend that you start from the standard Arabic. Yeah, I think uh, that ends uh, the today's. Uh, uh, presentation thank you so much again and if you have any questions we have like 10 to 15 minutes